um, but I've understood, you know, the synchronicities and, um, you know, that was brought up in the training that I took for the collage facilitation. Right. So I'm just wondering, when you talk about things moving around in the psyche, is that related to the synchronicities? That yeah, we synchronicity end up would be that too. Okay. Okay, so um, let me just put this mic in here. So, you all here for me. Yes. And I Sorry. Wasn't That's why I love meetup. Okay. We asked about synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And so synchronicity is a meaningful coincidence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they, they're happening all the time. And in fact, this book that we're going to talk about is called The Tao of Psychology that mm -hmm. we're talking about tonight, Synchronicity and the Self. Okay, because, uh, let's see, the way to think about it is that you have hooks in your psyche, in your unconscious. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about these hooks in your conscious mind. But something happens in your life and suddenly you think wow that's uncanny that's mm -hmm. amazing I mean it's like tonight you, you yeah. saw Ben Han show right. up okay that was a synchronicity per excellence because I haven't seen the guy in 10 years right. and then all of a sudden here he is saying hello I, I was even struggling to remember who he was <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean I knew who he was but I was trying to re yeah. get his name and everything right and um, and so, but sort of that, that was a coincidence, okay? That wasn't a meaningful coincidence, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, it was a coincidence, and it, and it was a, one that was sort of out there since it was totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. You don't think it's a meaningful coincidence. I thought it was deeply meaningful, deeply significant. And I was sitting here, and I wasn't really paying attention, but I noticed it happened. I thought it was meaningful and significant. You don't believe it was. It wasn't to me, but it could have been to you. Okay. I just know things, okay, as right. we probably all do here at this right. table. Right. And it may not have seemed meaningful to you at the time, but dear, it will be. Yeah. Are you I, feeling the same thing, Karen? It well, will be. Yeah, it could well be. I, I, be. I don't deny that. I'm not, but mind you, I'm trying to You're run a video like and, right. <laughs> and but have a it chat will with be. people. And yeah, I mean, the man, had, let's the, man put, the man had come and you introduced, I'm sorry, what's your name? Sandy. Sandy, mm -hmm. Brenda. Hi. <clears throat> you introduced him to Sandy saying, this is the only man who came to my art gallery uh, here in Annapolis. And then, you know, April the 9th, 20, 2005. <laughs> Right. And I did not realize you even painted that that was even an outlet for you. I, didn't, I had no idea whatsoever. Right, okay. And uh, you are an incredible shaman, incredible shamanistic figure. Uh -huh. That you have these constant outpourings of expression of your Tao. Okay. Uh, I mean, because all the time, remember, I was reading Bolin, and it was right. very significant to me. That encounter was significant because I was reading about the great Tao and the little one. Okay, well, let, let me put it this way. It, it, it could be very significant for this reason. Uh, I've been sort of on the shelf since the crash of 2008 uh, because it came at the end of my career, and, uh, and I haven't been able to get myself going again, right, from a business executive point of view because of my age. But um, I do have a partner that I've been working with for about almost 20 years now who uh, is in Malaysia, and we keep in contact almost like every day or weekly, and we've done a lot of things together, and he's about to try to do something in the U.S., and with Ben Han, I built a company that became a public company, okay, <laughs> between 19, well, between 19, 1994 and 
2005, we built a company, which in 2005 became public. And he's the lawyer. Mm. He was the lawyer for that company. <laughs> and so the fact that he shows up on my doorstep uh -huh. all of a sudden, yes, you're right, Brendan, that could be meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you're yeah go, reaching out to do another company and then somebody from the last company shows up yeah I'd say there's a, a meaningful yeah okay so that's how the tarot works okay. too it's meaningful coincidence okay. so it doesn't matter what the reader says mm -hmm. because something the reader says there'll be a potpourri of things the reader says but mm -hmm. some of them you will will connect up in your right. mind. Okay, and it will bring up something from your unconscious that you weren't thinking about before, probably. Mm -hmm. and, and Debbie has made me go back and think about, okay, how, how's, this, how's this a synchronicity uh -huh. that Ben showed up tonight, right? right. And look, it surfaced. <laughs> and it surfaced, right. It wasn't far away. I, you know, actually, it crossed my mind just instantaneously <laughs> while he was here, but... Um, then you've got on to other things. And, yeah, mm -hmm. right. So, so those things do happen all the time. And um, so, um, anyway, I, I, I'd love to give you a pressy about Jungian psychology, but um, let, let's see. Does anybody mind, uh, because, uh, with the exception of Brendan, most of you, you've only been with me once, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, if I could work for about 10 more minutes on sort of my vision of where all this goes. Um, that would be very nice. It'd be sort of an overview type okay. of thing, Thank and you. it's for the mm -hmm. 7,000 people that come to the YouTube right. site also. Um, so, uh, I was before we started the video, you and I were talking about the fact that uh, we think in images, mm -hmm. and it's actually the way our deep unconscious communicates with us. And so, the significance of the Red Book, uh, let me just pull out a copy of the Red Book so you know what it is. Um, the significance of the Red Book is... So I'm working with the Red Book by okay. C.G. Young. Uh, this is the Reader's Edition. So this is about 25 bucks. The real Red Book is about $150 on Amazon. But the images that are in it, all of which were done by Dr. Young, um, are dramatic, but you can find them on the Internet. So, to, uh, and... Uh, you never know, you might find them in the Dropbox, mm. <laughs> if you look carefully. Uh, what is this? You better recall what you're talking about. Okay, by all means. Okay, so, uh, so from a psychological point of view, mind you, I'm not a mental health professional, but we all have to develop, and you talked about early childhood development, mm -hmm. and so... All of us go through stages, and um, Jung defined these as kind of archetypal stages. So we're first we're a child, and then we're an ingenue, and then we become a mature person with a family of our own, and then we become a wise old person, either um, you know a wise old woman or a wise old man, you know grandma type thing. Uh, at the minimum, we would do, every human being goes through these phases, right? And so the central idea in Jungian psychology is the idea of individuation, which means finding in yourself what you and only you were intended to do and be in your lifetime, okay? And... The, the problem is you can't get going on it too early. And so just a, a warning to my friends around the world who are 20 or 21 years old who are hot to trot to get going on individuation, uh, I would urge you to uh, go slow. <laughs> You're not ready. 
<laughs> okay, okay. So here, here's what happens. You, during your childhood and teen years, you develop an ego, so that you, you know, the you know that that's happening with a child when they say no to you. Okay, the first time a child says no, you know that that child is developing an ego now, which is a good thing. Okay. And it should be encouraged. Okay. Um, but when you develop an ego, then you're in school and you're learning how to be part of the mass. Okay. You're learning how to be a, a citizen type thing. And um, so, you know, at the end of high school, maybe you can fill out a checkbook and, and uh, do what you're told if you go to get a job, whether it's a man that goes out on the highway and starts doing road work uh, or a woman that becomes a homemaker at, at that age. That's the way it is in a lot of countries, not necessarily in the U.S., but most places it is. Uh, and most women around the world are very lucky if they get any education. Um, and so you're, you're learning how to be a human being in your society. Okay, so we're, we're born, we're wild animals. We're literally a wild animal. And our parents have to train us, bring us along to the point where we can make a contribution in society and hopefully develop a strong ego. So before you start the individuation process, you really, really want to have a, number one, a developed ego and a, an understanding of basic morality and character in society, okay? <clears throat> because what happens is that when you get to midlife, something happens, okay, and it may be good, it may be bad, it's, I can go through the big ones that happened to me, <clears throat> but uh, they, all of a sudden you're knocked off your game somehow, okay, you were planning to be a school teacher and you didn't become a school teacher for some reason, right, and uh, and so then you have to find yourself and figure out what you're going to be next, okay? And it can be very, very different. So um, in my case, I, I'll just run through the big issues in my life. I was the son of a naval officer, so I was moving every two to three years. I went to 13 schools in 17 years. And so that means being an entirely new environment every year basically during my whole growing up period and learning how to fit in and what that meant was I became introverted because I would go to a new place and I wouldn't say anything for six months and gradually I would interact with people and I would start to find a place in that new society um, and but then as I was coming out of uh, high school, uh, the Vietnam War was kicking off, and so whatever I thought I might want to be at the end of high school when I was going to go to college, um, you know, it was looking like Vietnam was <laughs> was a big deal, and I better figure out what to do about that. And it was a problem for everyone in our generation, which is, uh, you know, are you going to go to the draft, or are you going to join up? Or are you going to Canada, right? And, and so that wasn't what I wanted to do, per se, but I was, you know, it was the family business. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I wanted to go in the Navy, and, but oh, by the way, I was blind, so I couldn't get in the Navy uh, to be an officer, which is what I wanted to do, right? And so I couldn't get an officer's slot because my vision was too poor. And so when I was finishing college, I joined the Marines, okay, and went to Marine Corps OCS and became a Marine Corps officer. And um, so then I'm going down that path, and I'm a Marine Corps officer and so on, but I've been to Vietnam, I've done my thing, and oh, by the way, I happened to be roomed the last three months with three lawyers. 
and the chief defense counsel, the chief trial counsel, which is the, the prosecutor, and the military judge were all living with me. <laughs> Very weird. <laughs> and they couldn't talk to one another you know, about their cases, so they talked to me about going to law school. So they convinced me to go to law school. I went there, and um, it, I really loved it. I loved going to school. I loved going to law school and becoming a lawyer. And then I became a lawyer and found, it out, found out that I detest the practice of law. <laughs> Absolutely detest it. Okay. So, um, so then what? Now I have two kids and a third one on the way. I've been practicing law for five years, and, but I detest it. And I ended up um, getting a job in a company that let me go to Japan and build a new subsidiary there. Okay, and I did that for five years. And I loved that. But my wife didn't. <laughs> she didn't love living in Japan. <laughs> and so I had to come back, age 39. And, um, and it meant that I had to leave that company when I came back and didn't want to do their bidding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now I'm 39 years old. I'm a lawyer, MBA, Japanese Chinese speaker, and I couldn't find a job. And it was stunning. I was unemployed for two years. And since that time, I've had to build all of my own jobs. Okay. And as I indicated earlier, one of those was uh, became a public company, but it's literally a company that I formed with two Indian partners on my back porch two miles from here. <laughs> and, uh, and years later, I mean, I, ultimately, uh, we be had the largest dedicated circuit between India and the United States right here in our office. <laughs> Uh, and and so it was a dedicated cir circuit, meaning we could run like 200 telephone calls mm -hmm. through it. Plus, we could do a lot of other businesses, which we did do uh, through it. But the one I was talking with you about was the <laughs> was the tarot readers. <laughs> so I trained all these young Indian guys to be tarot readers, right? And. And so this is after having gone to business school and law school and all these things, and here I'm teaching kids in India to be tarot readers. Now. How was that? Um, how was that with their uh, alignment with the Hindu religion? How did they did they accept that? A lot of the what? Like the Hindu religion, was that a problem with that? No, no, no. Okay, I wouldn't think so, but no, I mean, I'm so so I'm surprised that they didn't already know some form of divination. Oh, they do. Indians do a lot of divination. Right, but not right. tarot. But not tarot normally. And, <laughs> and, uh, but it so happened that in then Madras, now Chennai, mm -hmm. there was this one young man who was about 30 who knew a lot about it and could train me so mm -hmm. that I could train my 40 guys. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Weird. Okay. So it was working well. Uh, except that um, ultimately uh, I had to take money in to build this company up and that meant my 33 percent of the company got whittled down to less than one percent and a lot of the money that started the company was Indian money and so I got pushed out of the company okay and um, you know, in a, in a fair and reasonable way. I'm not saying that it wasn't uh, fair, but, you know, I had been on a board of directors of 10 people. I was the only non-Indian <laughs> in the group. And, you know, they really would have preferred to get rid of me much earlier, but they just couldn't. So, they, so as I was building it up with them, but they needed my, my inner interaction with the whole thing. And so here I am in 2008, 
now, and I started to invest in Indian real estate. I had a fairly good nest egg set aside by that time. I'd been involved in getting a company public and so on. Um, but I, did, I invested very heavily in Indian real estate, and Lehman Brothers went out of business, go figure. So they'd been in business for 187 years, and all of a sudden, just at the end of my career, when I put all of my money into that, into a business that I was working with them on, um, they went bankrupt. <laughs> and I was left high and, high and dry. And so I had a bit of savings, but over the years that all got spent. And um, so ultimately I ended up losing my home in mm -hmm. foreclosure, okay, and not being able to get back to a position where I was making good money like that. Mm -hmm. But through all of those disappointments, and there were plenty of them along the way, um, Dr. Young was with me, okay, because I started to read him, read him in 87, and, and uh, it just, he always was like my shrink, okay, and it's, it got to the point where I can pick up any Jungian book and read a paragraph, and I just feel better because I've plugged back into his thinking somehow. And um, so a lot of people get upset, young, young men especially, uh, because they have bad dreams and bad visionary experiences, or they, they have a bad drug trip, right? And they need to understand that and understand that those are real things, <laughs> you know, you can't ignore them. Um, and, you know, lately, I guess the last five years or so, Johns Hopkins has been mm -hmm. doing testing on helping people with schizophrenia and other uh, mental disorders mm -hmm. by giving them um, drugs, psychedelic drugs, and giving them a trip, uh, which uh, often can help people. But it has to be done under mental health supervision, okay? It has to be done under really serious mental health su supervision. And um, we have, um, well, we killed 72,000 people in 2018 with drug overdoses. And so we can't recommend that to people. It's better that we just explain to them what's going on with their their minds when they're having having you know these dreams and visions uh, that are that are pretty dramatic and they you know everybody has dreams I suppose and you can have nightmares or whatever and those are real things and those are your psyche telling you something you need to know okay it's not something you can just ignore. You can't ignore it uh, because because this is the way. Remember, I was talking to you about the two, two million year old man. This is the way through evolution, our bodies have learned to keep us alive and reproducing. Two things, right? Two things we have to do to keep going along, and so uh, our psyche is designed for that. Those two functions keep you alive and reproduce. Once that, nothing more, okay, from you. I mean, okay, I might get something more, but, but those two things above all else. And so when you have a bad dream, or if you have a vision, uh, you have to pay attention to it. And I started to realize that I, d I don't need a radar detector, okay, um, which is a me mechanical device. And the reason I don't is because very often I get a vision of a police car, black and white police car with the word police written across the side, going from right to left across in front of me. It's a vision that I have often while driving. When I have that vision, I slow down and I pay attention because invariably within one to two minutes there will be police activity. It might be a, it might be a speed trap or whatever but it means that my unconscious has picked up on subtle clues in the environment that I didn't see consciously, but my unconscious saw it, and it says, 
police car, pay attention. <laughs> and I have that vision every time. Okay. Um, and, and so I'm sure for you and everybody that pays attention to it, things come to mind. And when they come to mind, you should pay attention. You're, that's your psyche trying to tell you something about that situation that you need to know. And so, for example, I've probably seen three or 4,000 movies in my lifetime. And, you know, every day, five times a day at least, uh, something will happen and a, a vision of a scene from a movie will come to my mind, complete with dialogue and everything. I mean, I can literally recite the dialogue. And whenever that happens, I know that's my psyche telling me something's going on in your outside life that relates to this, okay? And so pay attention, what is the, what's the connection mm -hmm. between the two? And so that's why it's important to do things like keep a dream journal mm -hmm. and so on, because, you know, it may not, one dream might not be enough. It might, um, you know, there might be a series of dreams that's telling mm -hmm. you something's going on. Um, but, but it's your psyche telling you something that you need to know. They're messages from yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, in the course of his career, Dr. Jung started to refer to the self as the greater personality. He also referred to it as the God image. Okay, it's the image that is in each of our psyches of what we would think of as God, whether, regardless of religion, every human being has a depth, this image of something that's driving you, that's telling you to do something. Okay, so um, you can't tell me what you will be doing two minutes from now, okay? But two minutes from now, you will be doing something, right? Could be walking out and saying, ah, I'm not gonna listen to this stuff anymore, or, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. But, but you're driven to whatever you do two minutes from now by this self, this unconscious psychological function. Um, and so if you connect with that, which I always do in these sessions, okay, so um, since the beginning of this video, I have not been talking to you from my ego self, okay? I have been talking to you from my self self because something pushed me to start this group a year, couple of four years ago, and it's been an ongoing thing, so I'm kind of like in the flow, and so I can tell you all these things sort of off the top of my head because it flows out once I start, right? And um, so, you know, Dr. Young had a lot of specific things that you could define in an in a old school psychology kind of way, but it's not really about that. Okay, so let me give you an example. There's this very famous psychologist, I think I mentioned him earlier, named uh, Jordan Peterson. Okay, he's a professor at the University of uh, Toronto, and uh, he's a brilliant man, there's no doubt about that. And I want to preface this by saying that I agree with about 99.5% of the things that he says. Okay, except there's one problem. And that is that he thinks that his mission is to rescue the Logos. Okay, now the Logos is um, the word. Okay, if you think of the book of John, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that's all well and good. And based on that fundamental idea of, of rationality 
and you know you follow your book, whatever the book is, and you can build a cathedral, or you can build a restaurant, or you can learn how to be a chef, or you can learn how to be a, a, a creative person of some sort, right? Um, and you know you can get all that out of books now. We've mm -hmm. developed civilization for two thousand years, and that's good. But the problem is this isn't alive. Okay, there's nothing living in a book. Okay, until you put something into it. So let's take a cathedral. Okay, you can build a cathedral, and that's very fulfilling, and that's eros when you're building it. Okay, and so men love to build things, okay? And they love to have, you know, the tinker toys and we're gonna build such and such with the tinker toys, whatever it is, on up. And so you build a cathedral and it's got beautiful stuff in it, um, but unless you put life into that, there's nothing happening, okay? So the opposite of logos is life, okay? And, uh, but I mean, it's also called Eros, which has the smell of something erotica, but it's not erotica, it's life, okay? And, and so, um, basically everything that's Logos is dead, it's dead, okay? This isn't alive. It's only alive if I passionately tell you why it's important to you. Okay, then it's alive, but while it's sitting on your shelf, it's nothing. Okay, it's just, it might as well be a red doorstop. Okay, the same's true of the Bible. Okay, uh, and so the Bible is, um, I'll, I'll make this concession to the evangelicals the Bible is 100% true. Okay, uh, and it's 100% true partially because it's a historical book, but also because um, every religious statement in the world, not only in Christianity but it, or Judaism or whatever, every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world, okay? And, and um, what, what a lot of theologians sort of overlook is that when you get down to uh, John 1.12 and 1.13, okay, so John 1.1 1, 1 is in the beginning was the word, right? But you get down to John 1.12 or 1.13, and all of a sudden it's saying, um, and then, you know, here's Jesus, and he was the light and the life, okay? Mm -hmm. the two things. And, and so... Jordan Peterson's approach to psychology is the only important verse is in the beginning was the word, but that's not the only thing. We have to have balance because we have to put life and light into that word, okay? Or it's nothing. Okay, this restaurant is nothing when it's closed, right? It's only something when we put life into it, when we come and share our bread here, okay? All right, so why does, is this important? It's important, okay, I had one divorce. And uh, I was together with my first wife for 17 years. And um, then we broke up and I've now been with my second wife for over 35 years, okay. Um, and so what we fail to teach children is the Tao, okay. The Tao. Um, so, and the key of Taoism is the yin yang, correct? Okay. So, there are opposites in everything. Everything has an opposite. Okay. And typically, um, the masculine side of things um, is called the yang, and the feminine side is called the yin. And in Taoism, that circle that's the yin-yang symbol is actually circulating. And oh, by the way, there are smaller and smaller yin-yang symbols on both sides of the symbol as well because there are layers to it. Mm 
Okay, so every every opposite that you can think of, and there are thousands of them, would be a, would have a yin and yang to it. Okay, and whether it's appropriate to refer to it as masculine or feminine is a different issue, but um, but everything has its opposite, and so um, so the issue that has come up regarding um, three people that some of us have been following on YouTube is Jordan Peterson, a, um, a theologian who's a reformed minister in Sacramento, California, and a philosophy professor named John Verlake in also at the University of Toronto, is that they don't get yet the Eros part of this picture. So they're very one-sided and they're very shallow. Okay, and so for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, John Verveke is a tenured professor at the University of Toronto. He's done 50 lectures on YouTube, you can find them, on awakening from the meaning crisis. Now, if I ask you uh, what is the meaning crisis? What, what, what would that be to you? Do you have any idea? Just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of what you talked about earlier about what is my life's purpose. That's okay, what I right. got. Sure. <clears throat> and next. Oh, and I'm it, sorry. I, no, I, and, and I do want to say if my eyes are closed, I'm really focused because right. light takes away from me so right, okay. I just want you to understand okay, that so I'm that, really that's listening fine. Being, being internal is so if fine. you don't so think when I inter- go like that I'm being yeah, rude. That, that's fine but when I say meaning what it what it, I'm, I'm with Sandy I definitely see that as purposeful okay so yeah. the meaning of your life right? yes okay Brendan do you you're have? asking for the meaning of crisis well, we, we, we have a crisis in the world now because we have millions of young men, especially young men, because most of the followers of Jordan Peterson are young men. We have millions of young men who are nihilists, okay? Mm-hmm. And they can't, they can't bring themselves to believe in anything, and they can't see a meaning to their life, right? And so Jordan Peterson has helped some of them very definitely, okay, because uh, one of the things he did about two years ago was he did 13 lectures on uh, the first two or three books of the Bible, okay? And he went through the key biblical stories talking about them from a psychological point of view. Now, young, especially young boys are raised to be very logical, to love math, all that stuff, right? And so, and they couldn't get it about what religion is about and for, okay? And so, when Jordan Peterson tried, started to talk about these stories of the Bible in a very rational kind of way, in a very psychological, rational kind of way, uh, it linked with a lot of people. And people started to go back to church. And this is what brought the theologian, mm. Paul Vanderclay, into it, because he saw that people were all, all of a sudden interested in the Christian church and he's for 30 years been seeing his pews emptier and emptier and here's the psychology professor who's not even a theologian is bringing back people back to christianity what the heck's going on and there's a there's another one there's uh, this bishop baron out on the west coast he's a catholic bishop and he's the chairman by his statement about six months ago, so it may not be exactly true today, uh, but about six months ago he says, well, I'm the chairman of a committee of Roman Catholic bishops whose job it is to bring people back into the church. And our results are that we're losing about six for every one we bring in. Okay, 
And I said, as a businessman, I said, whoa, <laughs> you can't be my sales manager anymore. Sorry, <laughs> you need a different approach. And, and his answer to the approach is, well, I guess we have to teach the catechism better. Okay, but no, you don't have to teach the catechism better. You have to teach people why it's meaningful and important in their lives to have this. Okay. And, and so teaching people, you know, to say the Hail Mary, you know, okay, who cares, you know, but, but if you understand the meaning of what it is and why it's important to you and why it's going to be important for your whole life, that's something different. Okay. Brendan, you're getting a little red face, so do you well, have a... Yeah, you still haven't answered my question. You're asking me to tell you... <clears throat> What's the meaning of crisis, or what's the meaning of our crisis as you... No, what is the meaning of crisis in the context? Uh, this is especially related to these young men yeah, okay. who have become yeah. nihilists. What is the meaning crisis right. for these nihilists? Right. And, and so John Verveke, who's a philosophy professor at the University of Toronto, has mm -hmm. just been tenured. Mm -hmm has done 50 one-hour videos on the topic, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. It seems to me that the crisis comes from asking the wrong question. Right. Mm. So asking a question which is inappropriate. Right, okay, so <laughs> Debbie, do you have any other thought about this? Uh, I'm gonna go take a, a step back to what you were saying before about the yin and yang. And, and, okay. Uh, uh, there are polarities, and uh, the meaning crisis uh, I had just been through, as my dear friend Karen here knows, uh, it will be two years on April the 9th, 2020, that my whole life was, I was widowed. And, okay. Uh, so, polarities. Out of the meaning crisis, with the polarities and what you need to search for in what I, I'll make it personal, what I need to search for in my purpose is the polarities. Yes, I've had some really horrible things happen, but I have to find out what the polarity is because with the negativity there is a positive in there somewhere. Yeah, and there's and a balance in there. There's a balance oh, in there. Something yeah. very strange happened to me New Year's Day that I did not expect. I ended up being alone New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, mm -hmm. which I did not expect. Um, and I thought I was going to be just devastated and crying all day. And I woke up that morning and it was like a breath of fresh air went through me. And this is something that Karen was going to hear later, but she gets to hear it now. <laughs> I turned a page. And not only did I turn a page from the past two years, I've turned a page for the past 35 years. I have turned a page. It was something Karen told me to do. Take your past and blow it away, Deb. Uh, I turned a page to the point that I felt like I was a different person. Uh, and this is going to sound really ridiculous, but I have a grand piano in my living room. And uh, I sat down at the piano, and I, the piano went into the condo on, uh, in October of, of, of 2018. And so I've been playing the piano a lot. I sat down at the piano and it was like, for, it was like I had never played it before. It was like I had never heard its tone before. It was like my whole style of playing was different. It was softer, it had more meaning, it had more depth, it had more layers. and. I don't know why. I can't tell you why. I just know that out of the meaning crisis for me, a page turned on the first day of 2020, right. and I became, and what I want to see the polarity come out of this, I have been at my very, 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 very worst. And what I want to see come out of it is I want to see a better version of myself. Right. So that is... How and that's crisis. a transformational experience. Message, that's yeah. a that's it's a religious here, yeah. That's and a it was religious so quiet. experience. Mm. And I'm right. not usually well. 
And so your whole life changes yeah, going forward. Yeah, my whole life. I have turned a page. Because of those. Okay. And, and so I've, I've had many major ones, okay? But I, I have synchronicities happen to me every day that are not as dramatic as that. As it was the, really I bizarre. Say this, I did not want to speak to you last time because you were extremely toxic, extremely damaging. You brought a lot of poison with you. I know, and I, but I released it. You released. You, well, you, listen you to projected, what he's saying, Debbie. You released and projected a great deal of toxicity last time you were here. Very disturbing. Mm -hmm. And I shared it with Skip and Bill after you left. I was surprised that came out. I didn't expect it. It was extremely ugly. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing is, I share with you now the same experience you experienced in New Year. Yes, because you were very upset You had the same experience on New Year's? Or? Same experience in New Year's. You were very business. upset and depressed. I was well, feeling I know, for I was, you. Well, I know. You were, being very, you were being very aggressive. Mm -hmm. Your spirit was very aggressive and bullying and intrusive. Oh, my goodness. Mm. You were really, really being nasty the last mm. time you came here. And I think you know that. Well, I know just at the end but something surfaces. Yes. But having said that, what I'm saying is... We shared the same experience in the year, which is very interesting. Almost mm -hmm. identical experience. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience before Christmas with Brendan, actually, because Brendan is an outstanding musician and director, music director, and he pulled off doing Handel's Messiah with his whole church. And how many people were involved in that thing? about a hundred people. So he led the whole thing. I mean, he was the conductor of the orchestra. It, 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 what's the word? L-O-T-H-I-A-N? Is that where the church was? No, was no it's a different one. But it's oh, next, okay, next I was there the year before, and mm -hmm. it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you do another mm -hmm. one. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so anyway, it it's was fantastic. really... Uh, to do it. it. It was really impressive, Brendan. I, re I really appreciate being there. Um, and uh, so, but we digress a little bit because I want to come back to the meaning issue. So, the issue with what John Verveke has done is that uh, philosophers are logicians, they're logic people. They want to logically come up with an explanation for everything, right? But there's no way that you can logically explain how Debbie's life was changed or Brendan's life was changed. Uh, I could not possibly describe to you in any definitive way how I was moved by Handel's Messiah. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, you know, it wasn't... It wasn't the New York Philharmonic presenting, but it was very capable mus musicians who who pulled it off in a small church in, uh, in rural Maryland. It's a more meaningful one. It's though. very meaningful. Because you're Tremendous the emotion of real people, not right. But you can't define that, and you can't no, you explain can't. it. And um, I so. So my criticism of John Verveke, after listening to 50 hours of his lectures, trying to see what it was that was being missed, is that it's all logos, or most of it is logos. You know, in, in fairness to John, in the last two minutes of uh, video 50, he, he sort of pulled it all together at the end, and, and he had... Uh, earlier in the series, been talking about some Buddhist ideas, which, which he did quite well with. But throughout a lot of it, he was talking about the development of, of uh, Western philosophy, but from a definitional point of view, as if, you know, the solution to the meaning crisis can be written in a dictionary. And I can give you this dictionary, and now you'll be able to find the meaning of your life in that dictionary. That's not possible. 
Okay, that's not going to happen, right? If I gave that dictionary to to Debbie, she couldn't find that experience in mm-hmm. in that dictionary. Okay, because that comes from the psyche and it comes from our emotional side. Okay, so I was talking about marriages, right? Marriages, you know, when you get married, you think, oh boy, this is my soulmate and everything is going to be hunky-dory forever, right? But really, the two of you are bringing many opposites into a relationship, which has to become a whole. And naturally, because there there is going to be conflict there, um, it, most young people aren't educated that their marriage is going to have to be to learn from the other one the things that they don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so I mean the traditional role of women is has been the role of of making wholeness of the family, mm-hmm. right? To to create that, but to have wholeness in your marriage, you have to not only have a successful household and successful children and that sort of thing. But you also have to have a successful relationship with your husband. And if you can't talk to him for some reason because he's sitting in front of the TV watching a a football game, um, then it's pretty hard to have wholeness in the relationship. And, you know, I, I was never properly taught that when I was growing up, and that's basically the thing that, that caused my marriage to collapse because um, my first wife expected me to um, become, to come back from Japan where we had been with our three daughters and uh, become a householder and, and she wanted me to cut the grass and all these other things. Well, first of all, I'm allergic to everything that's green and grows, so cutting the grass isn't a a great thing for me. It was great for her father, that was her model, but it wasn't great for me because I've almost killed myself with a lawnmower a couple times because I got into sneezing fits while I was cutting the grass. And so I was never going to be that, okay, and never, and I never was that. And you know, she was just whipping up on me left, right, and center about how I had to shape up or whatever. And I said, no, I'm not going to live this way anymore, right? So that's why our marriage... You have to take environment into consideration. Right, but, but, you know, if both of us had been properly educated, okay, about psychology in the first place, then she could have understood me better and I could have understood her better. And we could have negotiated our way through these conflicts, but instead they just became incessant ar- arguments that we couldn't stop. And the only way I could get them to stop was to leave. Um, and you know, it doesn't mean I don't love her anymore. I mean, we're still in love with one another, and in, in some sense, uh, like brother and sister, in a sense now. And my relationship with my daughters, the oldest one is now 45, and I don't imagine my relationship with any of my daughters would be any different than it is today, even if I'd been stayed in the marriage for their whole growing up years. I mean, because I made an investment of time and effort to stay connected to them throughout their growing up years. But one of them was five years old when I left. That's hard. And, uh, you know, we have a sweet relationship now, and she's going to be 40 this year. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, and we, we, always, we always have had. But, uh, but I just couldn't stay in that family environment because we were never properly trained about psychology, about how a marriage works. You know, we were we were given some admonitions by some minister, you know, for an hour because it was mandatory before we got married. But 
you know, he, he didn't know anything about psychology either, so he didn't really say anything about these things. So, anyway, so, so this meaning crisis um, goes to the essence of Jungian psychology because Jungian psychology is about the opposites. And Dr. Jung says, in, you know, in, in the conjunction, there's either, you know, two opposites are either going to be drawn together or they're going to fly apart, one of the two. And any time, um, whenever two people meet, it's like the meeting of two um, chemicals. If anything happens, both are changed, right? Both are changed. And so, I mean, it's like this evening. Now, you're a new... Uh, chemical here and <laughs> and so um, you know I hope I see you here next mm -hmm. month you know the first Monday in February and we can go on with this but it may be that you're totally turned off by it and you fly away okay and that's a that's a natural psychological thing that happens mm -hmm. and um, and the conjunction is to be able to understand that the, the entire thing relates to that yin-yang symbol. Mm -hmm. And it's always turning. And so um, I did a reading today, in fact, that w that's about how men have a feminine side and women have a masculine side. And that changes over time. <clears throat> you know, it's... It's certainly why we have gay people, homosexuals and lesbians, but it's also um, in, in everybody. And so certain aspects of my persona is feminine, tends to be feminine. But, you know, I have no doubt about um, my manhood. You know, I served to lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps. God you know, damn it. Pardon? God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> what why is that? No, I'm just saying. Okay. Sounds like God damn it. Yeah. It sounds like Freud here. Well, you know, he this justified everything by saying his sexuality because he had six children. Oh, yeah, okay, but but <laughs> Freud wasn't getting it, you know. No, no, he was very well, If you if you haven't seen it, you should see a movie called um a dangerous method. A dangerous method. You okay, watch that. <clears throat> which is actually before Jung did all of his great work, before the Red Book, before everything. And the Red Book is the beginning of everything. Um, but it, the a dangerous method re gives his relationship with Freud and Sabina Spielrein, who was a, a, a third party, at, let's say, <laughs> for both men. <laughs> Um, and so that movie has a lot of interesting mm. insights. <laughs> That's what I can say about it. I think the thing that's most interesting about it, and this, this I learned from John, uh, was that everything in the movie is authentic, down to the items on his desk, oh, yeah. the chair he had. Um, everything was authentic. Um, and... Um, even even the things, the dream analysis scenes that they go through in the movie, all of it was authentic. And um, I think that's why when I saw it, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And then after the fact, I learned that I learned that from a guy who belongs to this group named John. And um, it made it mean so much more to me, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where I, I want to see the movie again. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've watched that movie at least ten times. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's one of those movies that that I want that you to really own can. for that reason. You know, it, because you see so much in it. So um, much going on in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, of course, I saw it after I was already well and truly into Jung's work, and uh, so anyway, to finish up on the meaning crisis. Let me, I'll just read a passage here, which is kind of a giggle from, from the reading that I was doing today. Um, uh, 
Um, okay, so this is in the middle of a, of a story that Jung is telling, but he says, perhaps you think that a man who consecrates his life to research leads a spiritual life and that his soul lives, uh, lives in larger measure than anyone else's. But such a life is also external, just as external as the life of a man who lives for outer things. To be sure, such a scholar does not live for outer things, but for outer thoughts, not for himself, but for his object. If you say, to, say of a man that he was, has totally lost himself, to the outer and wasted his years in excess. You must also say the same of this old man. He has thrown himself away in all the books and thoughts of others. Consequently, his soul is in great need. It must humiliate itself and run into every stranger's room to beg for the recognition that he fails to give her. This is the kicker. Therefore, you see these old scholars running after recognition in a ridiculous and undignified manner. They are offended if their name is not mentioned, cast down if another one says the same thing in a better way, irreconcilable if someone alters their views in the least. Go to the meetings of scholars and you will see them, these lamentable old men, with their great merits and their starved souls, famished for recognition and their thirst which can never be slaked. The soul demands your folly, not your wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought Bolin was great. The reading you sent us, the yes. on that, on choosing work and what the consequences are Right. You choose work for ambition. If the reason you choose work is for some kind of ambition that you have, what ends up it's just just wonderful, extremely perceptive, really, right. really inventive. Let's see here. Um, okay, so we had as read. Did I send you this reading also? No. Okay, it's chapter eight Possibly. of this book. Okay, so I, I think what's interesting, especially in this, and what drew my attention to it, was she's quoting from uh, the teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda. And this isn't Don Juan the lover, but I, I thought it was originally, but one of our regulars on the on the online mm -hmm. events when I do it every Monday except the first Monday um, corrected me and mm -hmm. told me that Castaneda was doing something else but anyway I think it can still apply to Don Juan okay <laughs> Don Juan the lover but anyway um, so Don Juan's advice to Castaneda was as follows anything is anything is one of a million paths Therefore, you must always keep in mind that a path is only a path. If you feel you should not follow it, you must not stay with it under any conditions. To have such clarity, you must lead a disciplined life. Only then will you know that any path is only a path, and there is no affront to oneself or to others in dropping it if that is what your heart tells you to do. Uh, but your decision to keep on the path or leave it must be free of fear or ambition. Look at every path closely and deliberately. Try it as many times as you think necessary. Don Juan emphasized the need to consciously decide which path to take, and he advised following what the heart feels rather than what the head thinks. The need to lead a dis disciplined life in order to have the clarity to choose is very similar to the effort needed to, the, to follow the Tao. Don Juan gave Castaneda the test question to be asked in choosing a path. Question, does this path have a heart? He went on to point out that all paths are the same. They lead nowhere. They are paths going through the bush into the bush. 
traveling on the path with heart is the point. Destination is immaterial. Don Juan seems to be describing an inner path like the Tao and to be emphasizing process rather than goal. He then contrasted the consequence of making a choice. Quote, does this path have heart? If it does, the path is good. If it doesn't, it is of no use. Both paths lead nowhere, but one has a heart and the other doesn't. One makes for a joyful journey as long as you follow it. You are one with it. The other will make you curse your life. One makes you strong. The other weakens you. Okay, so I thought that was the most powerful yes. quote. Uh, and uh, let me just read one more paragraph. Uh, to know how to choose a path with heart is to learn how to follow the inner beat of intuitive feeling. Logic can tell you superficially where a path may lead to, but cannot judge whether your heart will be in it. It is worthwhile to scan every life choice with rational thinking, but wrong to base a life choice on it. Choosing whom to marry or what to do as a life work or what principles to base your, one's life on require that one's heart be in the choice. Rational thinking may be an excellent attendant or helper, but it cannot know or feel what is intangibly valuable and what ultimately gives meaning. So that's sort of the significance of my comments on awakening from the meaning crisis, which is here we have a philosopher who's full of logic and he's giving you uh, every every philosopher's ideas of thinking about meaning since Plato up to today. That's what he did in the 50, uh, 50 lectures. But um, it's not about that. It's about what is meaningful to you. And what, what I know from a lot of education, I uh, have 10 years post high school, I, yeah, 10 years, is that I don't remember nothing from all of those courses. Not a damn thing. Okay, I, I can, I never, I don't remember a word from college. Uh, I don't remember a word from business school. However, I did learn three things in business school, but they were not in the classroom. <clears throat> and I don't remember a damn thing from law school. You know, I crammed it into my head and I went and I sat for the bar twice, once in New York and once in Florida. But, uh, you know, an education is getting your ticket punched, but then where, where are you going to be? Mm -hmm. And so where I am is right here, right now. Okay, and there's, um, you know, one of the things that I send around to a bunch of people, I'll send it to you, is called the eternal moment. And, you know, the great gift is now. This is the eternal moment. And, nice. and everything, that, everything that you and all your ancestors worked up to is this minute mm -hmm. and, and nothing more. And what, what Bolin was saying in that chapter about Taoism, or rather what she was quoting from Carlos Castaneda, is also significant about the eternal now. Yeah. Um, I, shared that, um, I shared that thing you sent with my therapist, and he said, oh, what fun for a Catholic. And I said, how do you mean? He said, because a Catholic's always going to compare the goodness of this moment compared to another one, and always going to compare the the eternal moment to the eternal moment of the archetype. Is the archetype's eternal moment going to be better? Am I, am I as good as the archetype's eternal moment? Because that's the terrible, the terrible um, thing about Catholics. They're constantly wondering whether they're good enough. Mm. And that's the wonderful thing about the Taoism thing, is it's a path. Hello, it's a path. The eternal yeah. moment is a path. Yes. And, and in each moment, you're making a decision about the path. Mm -hmm. And so... You're not judging the path. You're just saying, I am here. Yeah, I'm here, right. 
-hmm. And so, you know, for me, being here 155 times now since 19, uh, 2016, hmm. it indicates that this path is meaningful to me, um, but it may not be for you or others. Uh, but somehow, every time I've been here, except the very first time, um, there have been others here. And um, you know, occasionally it's just me and one other person, but uh, often it's, it's others. Mm -hmm. And uh, John and Bill, who couldn't be here tonight, both of them have been here with me, just the two of us a couple times. Found them very engaging, yeah. interesting in what they were. Right. In yeah. fact, there have been four nights when I've recorded it, but I couldn't publish what I recorded because it mm. became so personal. But mm. <coughs> now that, it, may I say so? I don't. Yeah, by all okay. means. Now being in retirement, one of my joys is being able to observe the chemistries of human beings. Mm. I really do enjoy that. Yeah. And I want to be an observer. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be so much alpha all the time. I spent my whole world doing that. And I do have a wonderful relationship who is very alpha, but that's fine. Cause we do it. As a matter of fact, he will ask me when I, cause he's a physicist. So he's going to ask, I spoke about this last time. He asked a lot of questions. It was very interesting because I want to just see the different chemistries of human beings together. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a teacher, collaboration was very important to me. You mentioned the yin and the yang, getting teams together since 19, well, I had a really good experience in the 60s. So I had teachers who collaborated, made us do that. Mm -hmm. So it really helped us in the male and female speak. I mean, mm -hmm. And I, I tried to do that as a teacher. I think yeah. I did okay, because it's so important, yeah, it really as you is. know. And it never ends, yeah. never ends. And unfortunately, I went to a college that was all men. <laughs> 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 it I went co-ed in the year after I graduated, <laughs> and and so we were properly mm. domesticated, I think, <clears throat> you know, or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> and so, anyway, the issue of meaning is what's meaningful to you, and um, <clears throat> and that can't be defined. And there's a very interesting uh, pair, Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who <laughs> are logicians par excellence. And Carl Sagan, I, I love him and everything I learned from him about astronomy and the cosmos, right? But <clears throat> he was absolutely anathema about anything that we've discussed tonight, okay? He would he would just I know. he he would just say that the tarot was baloney, right? Type mm -hmm. thing, and um, <clears throat> and so the last book that he wrote um, was about witchcraft and ha how you know we got to stop thinking this way because this is this is spoiling the world. And, and the crazy thing is, I've always wondered, because I haven't gone back, but does anybody remember the movie Cosmos? Okay, the, okay. I think I do. All right, well, the, then you won't. The, this will be meaningless to you. But in, in the movie Cosmos, uh, Jodie Foster yes. hear, yeah. hears a radio broadcast from out in space, oh, right? Okay. And... Um, and the radio broadcast uh, teaches humanity to build a machine. And so they build the machine and they drop her through the machine. And she experiences 18 hours of traveling through the universe. And what everybody outside sees is this ball dropping from the top of this tower to the bottom of the tower and landing in the water. And then she gets rescued. And it took five seconds or three seconds or whatever it took. But, but for her, in her 
where she was, she experienced 18 hours and she experienced her own father and various other things. And I, I can't remember, unfortunately, I read the novel years before and I can't remember whether that's the way the novel ends because yeah. Yeah. I never read the novel but I did remember the movie as you're speaking yeah. yeah but the movie ends with with her uh, not being able to explain the experience that she had been through and the congressman says well um, you know, 95% of the world's population believes in God, so, you know, <laughs> you know, you have the same problem that all those people do. So anyway, Sagan was very anathema about anything that was on the yin side, right? And so, so Neil deGrasse Tyson, in an interview that he did, talked about the the moment when he, as a freshman, or yeah, I guess a freshman at Cornell, went up to Carl Sagan's office, and Carl Sagan was already famous at that time, and here he is at the door of Carl, Carl Sagan's office, and the, how much that meant to him. And I said, you know, that's the problem, that he couldn't, if he wrote two books, he couldn't cover what that experience was for him right the meaning of that experience for him and and yet he like Sagan is anathema on anything that isn't all logic driven okay and the point is that that half of life is not logic driven that's the opposite and and in fact it is life because and it, you know, no matter how much you can get things rational down to the head of a pin, um, you can never quite tell how many angels are on that head of a pin, that. right? I can do. And and did you hear our conversations about uh, quantum physics? I was definitely, yes. yeah. I took that back to die. And really and what did he say? He said, "Did you tell him about that?" I mentioned it to someone that was his mentor that was yeah. in Caltech. So, so here's uh, Lothar Schaffer's book, Infinite Potential. And le recently we've been uh, um, looking at an uh, article by this Lothar Schaffer. Um, That's interesting. Because oh, I am. I'm really into this stuff uh, now. I really have. And he, he, what he does is he brings. He brings <laughs> Jungian psychology and quantum physics together. Okay. Yeah, and in, in his article, and um, so he wrote this book called Infinite Potential, which comports actually with what what um, what Bolin says in this chapter. Okay, where or what actually Castaneda says. He starts this quote that I read. Anything is one of a million paths, okay, and that's basically that's what quantum physicists say that there's a wave, there are waves in everything, and they don't they don't manifest until one of the waves is selected, and then they become a quantum, <laughs> and 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 so actually it's. So quantum physicists and Newtonian physicists have been trying for years to find the unified field theory, okay? And they haven't been able to connect them up, Newtonian physics and quantum physics, because they can't find the connection between the two. Okay, and the simplest example of it is light, and you probably know that light can be seen either as a wave or a particle, right? And the particle is a quanta which actually doesn't exist, but anyway, <laughs> picky picky. <coughs> but physicists will accept that light is either a wave or a particle, right? And, and so, um, so the point is everything is like that. And so Lothar Schaeffer's point is that Jungian psychology is the, is the changeover. And so 
we, so I, I have theorized that we are the unified field, that human beings are the unified field because because we check with your partner, okay? Tell them that, okay? We are the unified field, and and because we have in our consciousness both Newtonian physics and quantum physics, we've proven both, okay? Uh, and the only place that they can be brought together is in the human mind. Also have a lot of faith. Faith, and, and uh, there's a wonderful quote from Einstein I wrote down and had to redo it with him because of Einstein. I, to me, still believed in God. You know, he did believe in God. Who, who, who is that? Einstein. Oh, definitely, <laughs> surely. Don't. So, you know, I use Einstein a lot, but there's right. this wonderful quote I have, and I don't have it with me, of course, but it's basically that something has to be more than our human understanding in order. And I, I right. think that's a very small way of putting it. So basically, he's saying we would have to have a tremendous amount of hubris to believe that this is it, that we are it. Yeah. Basically, human consciousness. Right. And I love that one. Especially when you're dealing with a lot of uh, Now, what, what Jung implies is that we, as human beings, represent the consciousness of God. Yes, um, I love that. Right? Mm -hmm. and, um, I love that. It's hard for, for someone to raise Catholic. See, I wasn't raised Catholic, mm -hmm. but I'm dealing with a lot of Catholics. And with that, I see that with the rigidity, I, Learned that, that I don't have. Right. I never was told. I really right. wasn't. <laughs> and yet I feel I have tremendous pain. But that has to be something to a person. And Einstein says that. It's why a lot of scientists go the other way. It's because the rigidity of that incredible structure brought on to the child and the Right. But, but Debbie and Brendan. Um, Based on your experiences on New Year's Day, wouldn't you say that that's an evidence of God? Yes. Ooh. Okay. Yes. And but then I have very strong spiritual faith, mm -hmm. and I believe that, um, you know, to me, uh, religion exists but doesn't exist because I believe all, all is one. Mm -hmm. So, Brendan, you. I, 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 I don't know enough about your experience, but... Uh, well, my experience was similar in that I was driving along Route 70 in um, Manatee County, uh, heading to Sarasota, ah. and a very innocuous part of the highway, and suddenly I had the epiphany that I was never, have never been, will never be, and I'm not at this moment alone. And I had always thought until that moment that I had been. You know what the last chapter of this book is called, right? No. <laughs> alone. <laughs> we are not alone. You're not alone. Oh, interesting. The, the message of the Tao experience, we are not alone. Well, I have to say, when I read the chapter, I have to think to myself, how does he know what this shit I'm going through right now? How does mm -hmm. Skip know what I'm going through right now. Synchronicity. But it is synchronicity, but also uh, the um, Enneagram work that I do every day also speaks to that too, so it's very sure. interesting. Okay, and, and mind you, um, Jean Chenier de Bolin is not a proselytizer for Taoism. Okay? She's, mm. she's a Jungian analyst, mm. and she wrote um, to, well, many great books besides this one. This is a nice little one, and this one she wrote 40 years ago, back when she was a dish. <laughs> oh, yes. She was a cute one back then. So, um, what I believe is definitely the presence of quanta and waves, because two elderly Lebanese ladies, one came to see me on Sunday to talk about it, but her sister was spending an all-night, a 12-hour vigil at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem at the time. Uh -huh. And before she did this 12-hour fasting and praying and stuff, she said, is there anybody you'd like me to pray for in my vigil? 
and this Lebanese lady who knows me well said, yeah, I think we need to pray for Brendan. Aww. So the two of them, at the same time as I was seeing this amazing Aww. revelation of mm. praying for me. So you definitely were not And I do believe that there's a quanta going on there. Mm. There's yeah. a wave, there was a wave yeah, which was identified. Yeah. And, and, um, I mean, there's so much to this that still has not been researched properly because it, it first was um, suppressed, let's say. Mm -hmm. And by the way, a very famous Jungian quote is, it's best to nourish the soul because if you don't, you will breed dragons and devils in your unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm going to do that in, in calligraphy. I'm so glad you have my email that I want to see all these things. So we write them down. I can pass them along. So the, uh, the whole thing with me. Yeah. But San, Sandy is into, into helping well, people in with their soul, like right? Mm -hmm. and, beautiful. And beautiful. that's why I yes, mentioned I it to you. Is this from the church? Yeah. Or no, no. Um, it's actually what... I ended up being one. Um, brought me to this group because um, I'm mm -hmm. normally not focused, you know, in any way on, on the details of doing it. Right, right. But I became a soul collage facilitator. Interesting. Have you heard of soul collage? I have. I okay. know very little about it, okay. but I do know that it exists and it's yeah. very interesting. So a lot of it is based. The founder was a psychi or psychologist, yeah. and um, I've just been Absolutely. wanting to understand, you know, from I guess a different angle, more about it, and you know, to be able to articulate yeah. and understand. Yeah. 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 So you're open to this at this mm -hmm. part of your life. And I'll, I'll make sure I've sent you this. Very interesting. Because because Boland specifically talks about how to deal with the soul. Mm -hmm. And one of the, I mean, it, it's not soul collage per se, mm -hmm. but it's certainly that. creativity. Mm -hmm. Well, right? and I've had and, uh, a lot of So time. you can see what she says about mm -hmm. it in there. Yeah. Um, and this book is available, The, the Tao of Psychology. Mm -hmm. I actually so found a used copy of it. So. Amazon. So hmm. it's very interesting. That but anyway, she d she wrote a book, mm. uh, two books that I particularly like, and I've been I've known about my wife and I have known about for twenty five years. Called uh, "Goddesses in Every Woman and Gods in Every Man," mm. and so um, the gods and goddesses of Greek history are actually um, the uh, some of the archetypes. Mm -hmm in our psyche. We now call them complexes or archetypes, mm -hmm. but, uh, but the Greeks knew about them mm -hmm. and they, they named them, mm -hmm. right, and envisioned them and built temples to them, mm -hmm. right? And so for women, it's typically Aphrodite is, is the young woman, uh, then uh, the queen, let's see, the, who, who, oh. Yeah. Is Medusa a Roman god? Yeah. Uh, well, she's she's she's, she's the she's the negative side of the feminine power, right? If you if you look at the evil side of the feminine power, it's going to get you, turn you to stone. Um, I like the Celtic goddesses, which are triple goddesses. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so all these all these myths them. have been purified over the years as. Mm -hmm. As with tarot, as with astrology, Jung was into astrology as well, um, and you know, I mean, the way you can see it for sure is if you ever go in a Chinese restaurant and you look at the twelve uh, years of the of the Chinese zodiac, almost invariably it, it'll get you bang on, right? It certainly gets me bang on, and. The reason is they've been doing that stuff for 4,000 years, mm -hmm. and anything that wasn't right, they let fall away, but the things that were right came forward, right? And, and so they're, now they're right, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're not only right for Chinese, they're right for all of us. 
<laughs> human beings, right. for people. Yeah. Right, and that's why the tarot works too, because mm -hmm. we it's we all great. have these these different incidents in our lives, and so they they just are are true. Mm -hmm. Well, the tarot, 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 as you say, uh, is um, is a journey. You start out as the fool with nothing, and it is a journey. Yeah, and and your paths do change and open. Right. So I hope we've entertained you tonight. Definitely. Uh, we, I <laughs> so think we, we have to sort of wrap up because they throw us out at 10. But um, at least, so it was a worthwhile visit. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, great. And just, I don't know, like, I just love meetup. So it's really great to, you know, have a topic to bring I, I people agree. together where. Right. I agree. You know, I agree. How would you ever run into each other? Right. right, exactly. No, like, otherwise. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'll, I'll send you links to a few things okay. so that'll, that won't be so overwhelming, but mm. we'll try to bring you into... Okay. I would in, love that. I'm glad center. you have my thing, because I yeah. have had nothing, so I really want okay. to. Okay. Uh, and uh, I really do. so thank you to all my online uh, members for... Uh, sticking with us. Uh, this is going to be posted later today or later tonight or tomorrow morning. I was broadcasting, but what happened was the Wi Fi here isn't terrific. And so um, I was getting very poor video quality getting through to the people at YouTube and then and then the playback later on for others that come on oh. like two or three hundred people are going to watch this by tomorrow morning wow. okay and and uh the quality was so bad that i just had to stop and mm. so i just first two first monday of the month they can't watch it live oh. every other night every other monday they can but mm. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you so much. I, 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 hope, I hope the recording is useful to you. Do, is this yours? Or? No, I took it. You, after 15 minutes of rambling, I thought, I've got enough. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. There was, Thank you. Nice to see you all again. Good night. Nice to nice see you, you Brendan. <laughs> so... Well, I was dying to tell you the reason my eyes were closed because I thought mm. he's probably going to think, oh, that's the rudest thing. No, 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 no really. But I do want you to know I focus very well with my eyes closed, so it's just not being rude. No, that's a characteristic of introverts. Right. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah. I do it in church, too. Mm. I, I do. Yeah, my problem is that in church, I, I hypnotize very easily. Mm. And... And I don't know if you know how hypnotism works, but it does, in fact, work. And what happens to me is I get hypnotized. I call it zoning because yeah. mm -hmm. I do zone, mm -hmm. and I know mm -hmm. I do. And if I'm in there, I will not know if some, I could go like that if somebody, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very yeah. zoned in certain things. Yeah. But, I, I mean, I literally go to really? church. Really, in church. Who's in my, my wife followed this Tibetan Buddhist master for 25 years and I used to go to his talks and within five minutes he would put me out every time. Wow, that's <laughs> something. I don't know. That's, that's very good. <laughs> well, hypnosis is, is self-hypnosis. I guess so, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically confusing you, you your mind. To, you have to allow it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if you allow it, if you you're trying to listen to something that's that's unusual for you, and you know if I if I say, well, you didn't notice that fan until I just mentioned it just now, mm -hmm. and you didn't notice that light, mm -hmm. and you didn't notice that um, that plant that's across the ceiling, and mm -hmm. you didn't notice that those booths are red and so on. Now I've all, all of a sudden given you four different things to think about mm -hmm. in addition to what I'm talking about. And a hypnotist will give you 25 things mm -hmm. to think about. Mm -hmm. And and so it, your mind just starts to spin mm -hmm. and then they can drop anything in it if they mm -hmm. want to. Well, but you only accept what you wi will normally accept under normal terms on a conscious level. 
They can't make you do anything that you would not do. That's why hypnotherapy and hypnosis is still not, as you, were, you went to law school, right. is still, will not, will never, will not, at least at this stage, not, it's not evidence in court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's not evidence in court, but it, it is used in psychotherapy. It is used, um, yes. And um, so, anyway, thank you for coming. Oh, yeah, thank definitely. Thank you all for coming. And you just found out about it on Meetup? Meetup. Meetup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>